Hello, thank you for joining us today to learn more about the net zero challenge in the real estate industry. Whether you are joining us live or watching this webinar back at a later date, I hope this is an informative session and inform and highlights the importance of sustainability in an ever expanding and innovative world. Uh, so my name is Jessica and I'm the course advisor here at the University of Manchester for this part-time blended learning masters in real estate. So this course is an excellent opportunity to discover more about the fundamentals of real estate. It's a great opportunity to gain an LRICS accredited degree and to also make a future, uh, make a difference to our future landscape without the need to relocate or put your career on pause. So this is also an opportunity to gain a Manchester postgraduate education from anywhere in the world. So today I'm joined by two panelists who are going to offer an insight into their own experiences working in sustainability and industry and how their organisations are working towards solving the net zero challenge. So firstly, I'd like to introduce you to one of our alumni, Hattie. Um, Hattie, would you like to introduce yourself quickly? Hi everyone, I'm Hattie. I graduated from the Real Estate Masters in 2019 and then I joined Cushion and Wakefield on their graduate scheme on the commercial property pathway. Great, thank you. And Jack, you're one of our current students. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jack. I'm at Carter Jonas, uh, joined in 2019. Um, I've been doing the real estate masters for two years and I've got my dissertation deadline uh, looming on me for the uh, 2nd of August. A busy time of year for you Jack thank you so much for joining us and taking the time and um, so at the end of the session there will be opportunity for some questions but at any point if you have any um, for our panelists and you'd like to ask them about their experience on the course or anything like that please do leave your questions or comments in the Q&A box for us and them to read the sustainability itself has evolved into a topic in its own right however within our master's program the theme of sustainability and net zero permeates all of the units studied so throughout this course you will study a total of six mandatory units which span a range of fundamental topics from exploring geographical and sector markets in unit one the real estate markets unit to exploring the tactics used to proactively manage real estate assets in the sixth unit strategic asset management so you'll also study other units about real estate and finance, land and development, planning for future cities and property valuation. So additionally, you'll also study an elective unit. So you have a choice of three. So that is real estate law and practice, real estate modeling or the corporate real estate project. So within the corporate real estate project, you will learn how to support a business in, a, in achieving its objectives. Uh, so many of these objectives include environmental, environmental, sustainable and corporate governance goals. So our panelists today are also going to outline their own organisations and their corporate business goals as well. So finally, as part of the course, you will undertake a project based inquiry, which will broaden your understanding and investigate the research problem within the sector. So that's what Jack's obviously undergoing at the moment at this, at this very busy period for him. Um, so your day to day learning will take place through a range of e learning techniques such as interactive online tutorials, video lectures, case studies, group led discussions, things like that. And those will support and reinforce your knowledge during the course. Twice a year though, you will attend a conference which will focus on your recent, um, the recent units which you've been studying. So conferences take place in September and March, and depending on whether you join our September, September intake or our February intake, which is also available, the contents you will learn will uh, differ depending on the unit which you're currently studying. Um, so they will run alongside each other the conference as well. The conferences are an excellent opportunity to learn more about the industry from hearing about um, from industry experts in the field and building professional late relationships with your cohort and with your tutors and lecturers. So during previous conferences, we have hosted guest lectures, um, so they feature leading academics in their areas of expertise, such as Dr. Ian Mell, who is a senior lecturer in environmental and landscape planning. So he presented his findings during one of our previous conferences surrounding green infrastructure and how urban green space can be restored. So we're actually going to come in to uh, talk about this in a little bit more detail later on in the session. And I'll also include a link to some of uh, Dr. Mel's um, publications in the chat box in case you're interested in reading around this subject further. So in a recent article, um, which I did share with some of you yesterday, and I'll also share in the chat box, uh, the Built Environments Consultancy Group, or the BECG for short, conducted a report to determine the attitudes of councillors and MPs in the British government towards the climate emergency, and how these attitudes can be reflected in the built environment. 
So sustainability came out as a top priority for 89% of those surveyed, and the use of effective insulation and natural light in properties seems to be the most effective method of planning for a sustainable future within real estate. So during the course, you will deepen your knowledge of many different sectors through discussions with your peers. You're then able to apply the knowledge learned in each unit to your personal experience and the professional experience um, of your peers, so that which you've shared. Um, but in sort of specific unit wide, um, the valuation sector, um, obviously one of our units focuses on valuation, is rapidly changing to meet the demands of a green thinking market. So this is a market which prioritizes the carbon footprint of the property and also obviously increasing the value of the properties. Um, other, obviously there are other applications of sustainability within the valuation unit, such as the running cost of a property and how the value of a property might increase over time due to its sustainability and sort of energy efficiency ratings, things like that. Um, but these are just a few examples of the way in which sustainability ties into the course. Obviously, you will learn about future cities and the planning of more sustainable cities. And all of this content all relates back to your first unit. I'm sure it seems like a distant memory ago for Jack now, and um, the real estate markets unit, which is really the fundamental unit of the course, which you'll study in your first couple of months. So this is where you'll discover the fundamental regulations which govern each real estate industry in the market. So as an example, um, the UK government implemented the Green Deal in 2013, which allowed property owners to receive funding to make more energy um, saving improvements to homes. Um, so unfortunately, by 2015, the scheme actually had a low take up rate and the funding is no longer available. So this really brings into question whether the success of these, the success of these schemes in solving the net zero challenge. Um, but it is demonstrating that uh, markets are sort of making these regulations to try and support the challenge. So we're going to come on to talk to our panelists a little bit now. So I'm going to firstly hand over to Hattie. Um, so obviously the net zero challenge in real estate is a widely discussed topic, which spans the whole sector from all these various different topics, which I've just outlined. Um, but Hattie, why don't you just give us a brief outline, or Jack, if you prefer, um, about what net zero really means. So just an overview for our audience, what we mean by net zero in, in the real estate industry. Not sure which okay. one of you I'll, 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 I'll <laughs> Sure. Um, so to me, net zero is, um, well, it's in line with the government policy uh, of a net zero uh, UK by 2050, um, which basically means that the carbon output um, will be offset to either be zero or negative by that date. Um, I think there are some more ambitious targets um, being set um, by companies and sort of the devolved governments. So I think Wales and Scotland are now moving towards a 2030 date. Um, and for, so, for example, the company I work at, Carla Jonas, we're also looking at a 2030 date um, for our own company to be carbon neutral or um, carbon negative. So we have our own um, net zero target. Um, yeah, yeah. just echoing what Jack said, it's just kind of, I think people get swept up in the different definitions and so many times people in work come to me and go, well, Hazzy, what actually is it? I think kind of taking it back simplistically, it's just what's come, you've produced into the environment as a result of your activities, your projects, the embodied carbon in your operations versus what you're actually taking out. So I think that's kind of, yeah, what it means to me effectively. Great, thank you. But um, Hattie, we'll stick with you um, after your quick um, overview there. It's obviously good to set the scene about what we're actually talking about today. Um, but why don't you firstly tell me a little bit about your day-to-day -day at Cushman & Wakefield? Um, why did you first start working there? What your interests are within, um, within this organisation with regards to sustainability? Yeah, so I first started working, I was actually as part of the master's programme you could do um, like an insight week or you could do a placement so I'd done an internship at Cushion and Wakefield so as I was in Manchester I thought I'll just reach out and go back to them and potentially get some more experience in a different team um, and then they offered me a job to do kind of alongside my master's three days a week um, so yeah that was a bit of a stretch um, but it was really good experience so that was kind of how I started working there and from then got onto the grad scheme so it's coming up two years on the grad scheme. Um, my first team was public sector, so working with local governments where there's kind of increasing importance being placed on 
sustainability so new acquisitions need to be net zero um which is really obviously encouraging to see um, and then my current team is landlord and tenant um, for my second rotation. So yeah, that's around at the moment. Um, so the company launched their sustainability network in, um, I think, March 2020, um, kind of just casting it out for anyone within the business who wasn't in the core energy and sustainability team. Um, so I kind of just leapt at the chance to join that. So as part of that I'm the Manchester office representative. I coordinate events like Sustainability Week, um, attend the climate control meetings on behalf of Manchester. Um, and just, yeah, just general points of contact for anyone in the office who has questions about sustainability or how they kind of embed this in their service lines because it's just so varied within the business. That's really interesting. Obviously, you've made that big uh, effort to get involved in the sustainability practices at your organisation, even though your role doesn't necessarily fit into that sector. Whereas, Jack, obviously, you work in a very different sort of sphere within uh, Carter Jonas. Perhaps you'd like to outline your job role, what it is you do day to day and why net zero is obviously important to your line of work. Sure. So similarly to um, Hattie, I did an internship at Carter Jonas to start with, uh, which was in the summer of 2018. Um, and I'm from a very much a non-property background, so I did a geology undergraduate degree at Durham, which is a bit of a leap. Um, and then subsequently, I was offered a job at Carter Jonas to work in their infrastructures team. Um, and they sponsored me to do a master's of my choice, um, as long as it's a RICS accredited one. And I selected Manchester um, and got on the course and have been, been doing it ever since, really. Um, so my first role was in the infrastructures compulsory purchase team where our biggest client is hs2 so a lot of the stuff i've been doing there is working on land assembly um and you know it's the biggest project this country's seen probably since the motorways were first built um and a lot of the land assembly we were doing at the time is quite interesting is for carbon offset so looking at planting trees um things like habitat um re-establishment so new ponds um and then i moved into the minerals and waste team where a lot of my role is now based on consultancy um, and we work on things like energy from waste plants, recycling facilities, landfills. Um, and so, again, um, we're seeing like in the construction sector as well, um, things like concrete plants where um, there's, there's, there's opportunities for carbon offset and that's sort of what I do day to day. Great, thank you. Um, and I guess as well, all of the, the reasons why you are putting forward, your roles even exist, is due to your, obviously your corporate sustainability goals within each organisation. So Hattie, I know you'd had a quick chat with your sustainability team in your organisation um, to get a bit better of an understanding about exactly what those, those goals mean for your organisation. Um, is this something you perhaps like to tell us a little more detail about? Yeah, so we're currently working towards developing our pathways. We haven't got a specific date in mind yet but it will be ahead of what the UK government has put as their goal um, obviously the sustainability network was launched and as part of this they've kind of honed in on different pillars within the business to focus on um, so they kind of just include looking at energy travel waste within our offices um, and looking how we can actually mitigate the impact of our offices because that's kind of the biggest impact that we have um, and just committing to general UK-wide targets and EU-based targets as we're um, a global business. Um, I think our actual net zero target date is being released um, later in the year, so I won't um, give any spoilers away. <laughs> Well, I mean, it sounds like you're obviously making a lot of effort towards building that um, carbon neutral offset um, plan. And I wish you all the best of luck with your, with your climate champion work. Um, but Jack, yourself, within the Energy for Waste team, obviously, that's quite a high and has quite a sort of large environmental impact. Um, how sort of important is the, the net zero uh, challenge for your organisation? It's obviously quite a carbon focused uh, industry, I would say. Yeah, so the net zero um challenge is, is huge you're seeing a huge change in the industry like i've only been working here for a month and there's already been well not a month sorry for a year uh, and there's been a significant change over that time so when i first joined we were talking about efw so energy from waste plants um, potentially being sort of 
at once upon a time they were hailed as sort of the holy grail for moving away from sort of coal-fired and gas-fired power stations and landfills um, and EFWs were going to be the new big thing but recently uh, Wales uh, have issued a moratorium on EFWs so they're not allowing any more to be given planning permission or constructed um, Scotland are looking like they're going to follow suit um, as are England so we need to sort of focus on how we're going to move away then from energy from waste and to become more sort of sustainable. Um, and something else Carter Jonas has seen moving on is that our professional services have actually changed and we're offering sort of new new services where we're looking at things like um, natural capital. So we're offering specific valuation services um, for companies who are looking to offset carbon. And actually that's now starting to be classed as a valuable asset like property for the purpose of get into net zero so when you look at hs2 they're acquiring loads of land to um, offset uh, the construction uh, carbon and then we've got another big client who's an estate owner and they're looking at actually i'm not sure how you might know more about this being a uh, in commercial but in london i think they're looking at a scheme where if a company reaches carbon neutrality or negativity using property they own outside of london they actually get credits that can be used to um acquire cheaper property in central London. So I think that's a scheme the government and um, London are looking at. And it's something that our clients are thinking about at the moment um, and talking about sort of offsetting uh, already to make make a, the most of that scheme, really. Yeah, that's fascinating. And it's such a, obviously a difficult um, type of conversation with the all of these different sectors working towards the same challenge, but it's having to obviously employ all these different workforces to achieve this goal. Um, and you really do demonstrate there that it really does permeate all of the different sectors within your organisation. So that's really fascinating as well, not just obviously the sustainability team, for example, all teams need to be working together to achieve this, this common goal. Um, Hattie, I was going to move on to, um, to you next. To, we, we, we're going to talk about, a little bit more about facilitation within the sector. So, um, Within your sector, what would it be that would facilitate um, your organisation or your sector to move towards more sustainable practices? Um, so, yeah, there's obviously a lot going on in terms of the um, the Green Building Fund. I think Manchester's got 54 million for kind of shovel ready projects and there's 900 million kind of across the UK. But they're kind of larger one off projects. I think there needs to be more put in place to support um, in particular landlords so as part of my dissertation I looked at different countries and their kind of implementation of green infrastructure countries like Germany so they really support landlords if they say right install solar panels on your roof for um, sustainable urban drainage or you know something on their property they'll get a tax relief or they'll get a grant to do that whereas in the UK at the moment, the onus is really on landlords to kind of have that moral, um, yeah, well, moral judgment to make that call rather than potentially it being financially in their benefit to do that. So I think that would be something which could really um, accelerate um, sustainability within real estate. Because obviously the more demand you get, the more businesses kind of spring up and different satellite businesses off that. Um, and then it becomes more affordable for perhaps a smaller business or a smaller landlord to then implement those at their properties. So, yeah, that's just one of the things which could be implemented within my particular sector. So that was more of the legislation support. What about financial support? Would there be, uh, obviously you mentioned about the tax relief. Um, is that how you'd re require uh, financial support or would there be grants or anything like that that could support the, the process? Yeah, I mean, similar to the Green Deal, which was scrapped, that was individual homeowners, which were given money to improve their properties. You could kind of scale that up to commercial landlords. I think landlords kind of get a bit of a bad rep as being these kind of big, greedy kind of old men with all this money and not supporting them. But, you know, they are businesses, they are pension funds, which invest in them and they do need the support to be able to kind of implement this technology, which is at the moment more expensive than kind of typical ways we've always done things I think you need to give that support financially yeah in the form of grants or tax reliefs or even occupiers if you're an occupier and you occupy 
a net zero building, you might get reduced business rates. So it's not it doesn't necessarily all need to be on landlords. It can be occupiers um, who can then make that call and get the kind of associated benefits because of that. Yeah, but in order to achieve this, obviously, there needs to be some sort of push in the right direction from obviously the government or something like that. Yeah. Um, Jack, what would you, what would you um, think within your sector? So how could your sector move towards more sustainable practices? Um, so in minerals and sort of wider construction, um, one of the hot topics is the carbon given off by concrete production, which is obviously used in basically every, every building ever built uh, and for a lot of infrastructure as well. Um, so when you look at concrete production, it's actually quite local because it sets. So on average, concrete is made 16 kilometers or something away from where it's about to be used. Um, and the other side of that, though, is that it's it's 95 percent of it's produced domestically. Um, so it is a local resource um, and it tends to be recyclable as well. So concrete is 100 percent recyclable. So as much as people are talking about um, concrete being very bad for the environment in when it's first produced, which is probably fair enough. Uh, it is quite bad for the environment. It's a carbon intensive process. They are currently looking at um, creating low carbon concrete and changing the actual mix, um, which will reduce emissions by a, a lot. So I think when we look at HS2 specifically, um, they're looking at using a um, carbon neutral concrete in their construction, which actually will reduce the CO2 emissions of construction by 43%. So it's a huge, huge um, thing to change how we produce construction materials. And then at the end of buildings life cycles, if you can actually sort of uh, reclaim the carbon that was used in the concrete and reuse it elsewhere, I think that's also going to be a huge, huge change, which will reduce carbon in construction and, and property. Yeah, I agree. In terms of end of life cycle, which is what you're talking about with concrete like too many developers it's just not thought about it's kind of you just kind of throw up a building and that's that I think that's kind of growing importance things like timber which can be easily recycled and you can make that demountable so you can then reuse that at the end of it I think that's increasingly being used in developments and that'll kind of hopefully become more common practice yeah I think I think establishing the circular economy and um, the circular green economy is probably what will have the biggest change in sort of looking towards the net zero it's looking at mm -hmm. materials and reusing them and trying to reduce carbon and creating new materials and importing them from other countries actually um so that's a big one isn't it with freight um if you're importing stuff by boat or plane from say for example timber from germany to use over here um that's still quite a big um carbon outlay um to even get it into the country never mind the construction cost of putting it up mm -hmm. it's about making the most of it once it's here Definitely. Great. And um, I think well, obviously we've focused a lot on construction here, but a sort of large counterpart to construction is um, the, the final sort of product once the construction is complete. So we were fortunate last week to meet with um, some of the academics in Manchester and we were stood on top of this high rise building in Manchester, weren't we, Jack? And we were looking over the city and all it was was, was grey. And Hattie, we've also had a conversation about obviously the absence of biodiversity in city centres. Um, Hattie, I think I'll come to you first in this, but what opportunities are there for um, sort of green infrastructure and biodiversity in city centres? Um, obviously, you're quite familiar with Manchester as well, um, but UK wide or, or internationally? Uh, there's loads of opportunities. I'm <laughs> team green infrastructure. Um, I think Manchester, we do have some. So that if you're going to the Deansgate station, um, that's got a huge living wall. I went back into the office first time in a while and there's a huge green wall being installed. I think people just think it's like aesthetics. It's kind of like a, a flower wall vibe and it's not like it does a lot in terms of biodiversity, um, urban drainage, temperature regulation. Um, so there's huge opportunities on for like definitely the living walls. Um, in terms of green roofs as well, I think developers, they focus so much on the view and selling a view, but you don't realize people have the view and then they look down and it's just all concrete and that's not what people want to see. But obviously, unless it's a developer developing a whole site, they don't have control over that roof and they don't have control over that roof. So why would you, you know, put that effort in? So I think that's something which needs to be tied up. Um, I know that there's the new scheme at Castlefield Viaduct with the National Trust, which is really exciting, which 
um, is in, I think it's gained planning permission this week. Um, and that's kind of looking to echo what the Highline's done in New York. And that would be kind of huge attraction and that would bring some green space in. Likewise, at Mayfield, so there's a new 6.5 acre park. I think that's something that Manchester's really missing is green space when it's kind of a hot day and you think, oh, I'd love to have a picnic somewhere, but there's nowhere to sit. So I think that's going to be a great addition when that comes through. I think that's benefited from the Building Back Better fund as well. Um, so I think there is a lot of potential. I think Manchester's been quite progressive and quite ambitious with the targets that it's set. And it does seem to be supporting these kind of projects. So yeah, huge potential would be my final point. Jack and obviously we saw some of our own living walls last uh, last week, didn't we? And we were sort of admiring the opportunities available. Um, do you have any thoughts on sort of other opportunities available within city centres? Um, yeah, I think I would agree with Patty. I think it's about using the space that's existing more efficiently. I think when we were looking out over over the Manchester skyline, you could see a lot of sort of unused roof spaces, um, the walls of buildings, and things like that. And I think even just basic things like uncladded buildings add a bit of cladding in there retain the power efficiency that sort of stuff but then i think as well the base of the problem you've got um actually where's the power come from that these buildings are using um so obviously if they're off the grid they're going to be using um fossil fuel based power at the moment um, and i don't know if you guys are familiar with HiNet at all which is going to be a big um carbon capture um, and then hydrogen production um project in the northwest uh, it's it's due to be massive um based in manchester um i can't remember how much it's going to cost but i think it's going to be about um 18 billion something like that um, and they're looking at transitioning the grid to being um sort of more hydrogen based and using that as a fuel source um and i think that sort of change will be really good so looking at high net as well specifically um i think something like 80 percent of the 80% um, of the carbon reduction needed uh, is going to be accounted for just by high net by itself. So that's quite an interesting scheme that's coming forward in the Northwest to keep your eyes on. Definitely. And we also touched on as well, um, Jack, about the sustainability of Manchester. You mentioned obviously with the landfill, um, the landfill site in the south of Manchester, didn't you? And the effect which they're having on the city centre. Is that something you'd like to touch on slightly? Um, yeah, I can do. Um, so I think we were talking specifically about a large landfill to the south of Manchester um, that's currently active. Um, and I think a lot of the city's waste does go there. I think it's, I think might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it is the biggest landfill in the UK. Um, it's, it's a huge site. Um, and we're trying to move away from putting stuff into the ground, basically, through EFWs. But I think there's got to be an alternative, which would be looking at increasing recycling, because that the issue with landfills is a the methane that they give off um b the fact that you're putting something in the ground and see the life cycle so most landfills in fact all of them to get a planning permission have to have some form of post um, completion management plan um to look at going back to being sort of more uh, either green or to potentially be developed um, as a brownfield site so they do look at trying to offset um, the damage that they cause but i think long term we need to sort of look at moving away from landfills and towards recycling and um, that sort of green circular economy. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting the mention of the circular economy and bringing back to recycling. These aren't traditionally themes that you would relate with real estate, would you? You traditionally think of real estate as obviously property management, asset management, um, letting agencies, commercial properties. But I think it, uh, this discussion has really shown the extent to which obviously uh, net zero and sustainability really does impact all different sectors of the real estate industry and um, I'm not sure how much both of you remember the feature of sustainability throughout your master's programs. Um, are there any areas where you think were particularly useful going forward to your current roles now that have allowed you to, to go along this line? Um, I'm not sure if either of you can think of anything that comes to mind. Um, I think for me it was the elective modules. So I took a module with Ian Mal, I think you mentioned before, um, on green cities and that was really interesting. I think that's kind of what sparked my interest because I could see, I kind of was always interested in sustainability and kind of climate change, but I think seeing the link between 
property and seeing that I could that's something I could get involved with and that kind of had huge strides to needing to be taken um and then obviously kind of the core modules which um are really useful for your APC as well in general. Jack and yourself, obviously, currently you've um, coming towards the end of your course, so things might be a little bit more fresh for you. Um, but obviously, you've had the Future Cities module and um, the, the valuation and asset management. Have any of those been particularly useful for you going forward with your work working with e EFWs? Um, I would say yes. Um, more sort of looking at the valuation stuff, it's been quite interesting to see how um, that carbon offset and green buildings actually add value. So when you're looking at Manchester, I think in, in the um, markets module, you look at um, how green buildings sort of add value and people are willing to pay a higher higher headline rent for a building that's more efficient. So you go through that and things like um, BREEAM ratings, B-R-E-E-A-M, which are sort of becoming more prevalent um, in the market. Um, and then when you look at, we did the asset management module as well. Um, and it's sort of looking at how to make the most out of the assets that you've got and sort of making them more green does improve the life cycle of them as well. So that's also quite an interesting thing that was offered by the course. Great. I mean, it all loops back around to itself within, this, within the circular structure of the, of the sector, doesn't it, really? Um, but great. While we have a moment then, if any of our participants have any questions that they'd like to ask Cathy and Jack, um, either particularly about their, their roles or their impact within their, within their organisations or their experiences on the course, do pop them in the Q&A box now. Um, but yeah, we're sort of coming to the end of our session today. It's been a really interesting um, discussion surrounding sustainability. And I really think it's highlighted the importance of all of these organisations working together to solve this net zero challenge together. Um, so Jack and Hattie, are there any last comments you'd like to make surrounding the importance of this, um, especially in sort of a post-COVID world, I would say? What sort of changes can we expect to see coming out of COVID? Yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, I think COVID's kind of made people a bit more aware of their health. I think I'm definitely, there's been a lot of discussion around healthier workplaces. I think the massive drop in emissions as a result of people not moving has kind of proven that we can't, it is our own human behavior that's doing this. And we kind of can't go back to the way we were before in terms of traveling, you know, two hours to London for a meeting from Manchester because we can do this from home and we've proven that we can. So I hope that as a result of COVID, we kind of change our practices. We see that the way things were before weren't working and that we can work in new ways. Um, in terms of occupiers as well, I mean, there'll be changes to space as people work from home. Um, and the hope is that people kind of move to smaller space, which is more efficient, maybe aligns more with their own kind of sustainability target so a, a more sustainable building a net zero building more healthy places for their workforce bicycle racks that type of thing so potentially that could be an impact um do you want your thoughts are jack yeah i think you covered quite a lot of what i was going to say there to be fair um i think the nature of work has changed uh and it will continue to be changed i don't think we're going to go back and see people being expected to go be in the office nine to five. Um, I don't know about you, Hattie, but as a grad, you sort of expected to be in the office nine to five, um, showing your face to people cooking out in you basically. Um, but um, I think companies' attitudes are changing um, to sort of be more accepting to people working from home, even at a junior level. So I think that's quite interesting to see. Um, sorry, I'm just washing the window behind my head. Um, What's my train of thought now? Uh, yeah, it's also going to reduce commuting and people using cars. I think you mentioned as well when you look at, I can't remember who produced them. It might have been the Met Office. Um, when you looked at those carbon maps um, pre and post lockdown around London, like the reduction in um, emissions was ridiculous. Um, so I think that's quite an interesting thing to see as well. Um, the other way of looking at it though is that um, I think potentially people are going to need better and more IT infrastructure um, from home so home working is going to become bigger which means that the requirements and the, what companies need to do to provide for employees is going to change as well so it's about less about improving office spaces um, more about improving homes alongside that sort of match match the new home working ethic um, but again that's just sort of 
um, speculation at this point. I don't think there's any data to prove that, but I think we will see that sort of transition um, coming along as people do, as companies make money back by reducing office space and reducing carbon offset, you are going to see investment in employees working from home, I think. Thank you. That was um, a great little summary to end our session. We have had a few questions just come in while we've both been talking, so I'm just going to quickly run through those. Um, we've actually got a really interesting one, which is going to be great having both of you here. Um, so one of our uh, attendees of the session has asked about the differences between the two courses which you both studied. So obviously as a, um, a highlight, just to highlight the differences between Jack and Hathi's um, postgraduate qualifications. So Jack is currently studying on our blended learning master's programme and Hathi studied at the University of Manchester's face-to-face -face, um, one year full-time campus-based real estate programme. Trying to get all those words out in one go. Um, so I think it'd be quite interesting to have a little comparison between the two and how you found the difference in the courses. Um, obviously, you two haven't had a chance to discuss this between yourselves as of yet since you've only met today, but maybe you could both talk about the benefits, the pros and cons of each, and then it'll offer a nice little comparison. Um, Hattie, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, so obviously I can't comment on the blending learning course because I didn't do it, but I did the one year um, conversion so I just needed one that was RICS accredited my first degree was psychology at Durham so it was completely different to um what like the nature of the content at, um on the real estate masters so I kind of was looking for a one-year intensive course to kind of get the complete rundown that I knew I'd need to be able to do the APC and become chartered because that was kind of my aspirations um yeah, that's, I found the course really good. It was useful in terms of the practical element. So we kind of went to an office block in Manchester and got unleashed with loads of lasers and had a chaotic hour measuring them up. And that's actually been, yeah, I do go out and measure properties now. So that's kind of something that was useful. Um, probably like the breadth of the different modules you can pick up. Um, you can kind of tailor it. So if you're more planning focused, you can pick up a planning module um so yeah you can kind of tailor it to your interests in terms of the electives um but yeah I really enjoyed the course it kind of got me to where I wanted to be so yeah it was a good good move Jack where would you say the blended course sits in comparison to that as well where were your high, high points for the blended course yes yeah, so the blended course I think is really good um I think so unlike Hattie I work full-time and do the course as well so I get Monday mornings off to sort of have a bit of time to do the masters so it's been really helpful to fit around work um, and the nature of the blended course as well means that all the lectures and materials are recorded and available online so you can access them if and when you need them um, so they are all there um, so they can fit around your other commitments which is um, really good um, similarly to Hattie uh, I um, graduated with a non-cognate degree um, and to become a chartered surveyor, you need to have a RICS credit degree, which is why I applied and came to the Manchester um, course um, to get that RICS accreditation. Um, I think the modules as well have been really helpful. They give you a good overview of the property sector. I mean, um, they may be sort of um, UK specific generally, but you do get some global global um, parts to it as well when you're looking at markets that is that is a global module planning tends to be quite global as well because it accounts for the different planning systems and asks you to look into that sort of thing um so yeah i think it's been a good and interesting overview for the real estate sector great thank you both of you and then one last question for both of you and then i promise we'll we'll let you go and have your lunch um is both of you what's your favorite thing about your job role within the real estate sector with which you work so hattie what's your favorite thing about where you work currently um, sorry, that's really put you on the spot. I'm very sorry. <laughs> yeah, because oh, I hate my job. Um, I don't hate my job. Um, I think it's probably the variation in the term in terms of the projects that you get involved with. I think working for a global firm with loads of different teams, you kind of you'll be on a project and you think, oh, I really need you know the insight of industrial because you know I'm looking at this property or you, we've got you know land and development teams you've got resi teams so you kind of pick up different bits and it's easy to kind of yeah you just gain a lot of experience when you're working in that kind of environment compared to if you're working in a very specific um kind of smaller companies that's what I've really enjoyed 
and probably just like seeing things happen so kind of working on a project and then you know whether it's acquiring office space or working for a local government you're working on a project and then yeah you kind of see that come to fruition and it's quite rewarding um so yeah all the stress I don't hate my job as well so your employer's listening and you get yeah into the office later <laughs> um Jack what about yourself um what's been your favorite thing about working at Carter Jonas um yeah I think the variety is probably the biggest thing that's the most interesting like when I graduated I didn't want a job where I stood behind a desk all day every day I think being able to go out on inspection visit properties and sort of especially with HS2 like I've been down to fields where I've wandered around and spoken to landowners and then you come back you know, six months later and you see you know a massive embankment or the, the railway being put down and then with this um, with the current team I'm in as well the minerals and waste team it's like one week I'll be um, going to look at I don't know a, a concrete plant and then um, the next week I'll be looking at something completely different so it's good to get out and about and sort of actually get a bit more hands-on and not be stuck behind a desk I think that's probably the, the best bit about uh, working in property. Definitely a very good way of looking at it as well um, but thank you so much to both of you for joining us today and for all of our attendees if you're watching back or listening live um, I hope this has been an, just a bit of a different insight into the real estate sector as a whole um, obviously we try to tie these things back to the to the courses but we know obviously the, these, uh, the topic of sustainability is a very large one which I'm sure we could all talk about for hours so um, yes thank you very much to our panelists for joining us and if you have any questions I did put the email address in the chat box but it is studyonline at manchester.ac.uk UK, where you can get in touch with me to arrange a discussion about your eligibility for our course. So thank you very much and uh, have a wonderful rest of the day.